Bang! Neves Knives, I'm Jared and my lovely wife Kara is right behind the camera. Hi! So today we are going to do a full sharpening tutorial starting off with what kind of sharpening stone should you use. First we have natural stones. Now this can be your Japanese water stones or your Arkansas stones like these. This is an Arkansas translucent. It's somewhat of a special stone. It lasts forever. And then this is the same type of stone, just a lower grit. This is an Arkansas hard. Now these are great beginner stones. These are affordable. These are actually quite expensive, but Natural stones, natural water stones, things like that, they can be relatively affordable. These, however, you're supposed to use oil on. Now you can get by with using soapy water if you don't art if you don't use oil, but they are considered an oil stone. Now, Japanese water stones are obviously gonna take water, but these are for simple steels and carbon steels. So you don't want to use these for any high carbide or high wear resistant steels, simple steels and carbon steels. Now, this is a Japanese Nanawa Superstone. I do not recommend these. These are high maintenance, high advanced stones. Um, I really don't recommend them to anybody, but if you're very advanced, you could use them. But they're just very, very high maintenance. They are water stones, but they can crack, they can chip. You gotta dry them out a certain way. They're just, they're very, very high maintenance and very messy. These are good for, again, Simple steels and carbon steels, chef knives, things like that. Next we have aluminum oxides. These are great beginner stones. They're pretty affordable. They come in all different grits. They cut relatively fast. Now they're gonna be for, again, carbon steels and simple steels, but they're really good and they will cut super steels. The problem is, is they won't cut the carbides in super steels. So like I said, simple steels, carbon steels do great on these. Like I said, they're affordable, they cut fast. Now they require oil as a lubricant, or soapy water. Now, if you want to use soapy water, make sure you've never used oil on it. If you have used oil, you have to degrease it before you can use soapy water on it because the oil will basically retract the soapy water. Next, we have ceramic stones. Now, ceramic plates are good for honing and they're good for finishing stones. They're not gonna be mostly for sharpening. Now you can, like I said, use it as a high grit stone to, to put a polished edge or to refine an edge or use them to deburr, knock burrs off, and then do maintenance on your edge, you know, like in between sharpenings. But they are great finishing stones as well. They do, you wanna put water on them or soapy water. I like to use soapy water. Now. The thing is, is these things do last forever, but if you drop them, they will shatter. So you want to be careful. They are kind of expensive. Now, the one thing is, is that these don't have a lot of feedback. Unlike the stones previous to this that do have a lot of feedback, these do not. And feedback is basically just the, the feeling you get when dragging your blade across the stone and being able to feel your angles and things like that. These ones are going to be a little bit more difficult with that, but once you get used to them, they're great stones and everybody should have some sort of ceramic. You can use any steels with these because they're finishing stones. So you're not doing the full blown sharpening on them and you know, doing edge maintenance and things like that. It's not going to be a big deal. So you can use these on just about any steels. Next is diamond plates. Now these are my most recommended. They work for any steel, including super steels. They cut really fast. And in my opinion, they leave a lot of bite. They're especially good for super steels. Now they can run, run expensive, but they're very easy to use. And you also can find very, very affordable options. So that just depends on the brand, where you're getting them from, the size, the grit, all the good stuff. I have a Neves Knives store down in the description with my most recommended diamond plates. One thing I really like about these is you can use them dry. You can use a lubricant like water or soapy water, but if you don't want the mess, you can just run them dry and wipe them off with a towel after you're done. No maintenance they're very easy to use and they have a lot of feedback so they're easier to hold the angle when sharpening than any of the other stones be before it. Now these are tri stones. Now what's cool about these is you can get a balance of everything. You can get a diamond plate, aluminum oxide, and a ceramic all in one. So you have a reprofiling stone, 
um, a finer stone and then a finishing stone slash maintenance stone. You can also get these in all diamond where it's just a tri-stone with three different diamond grits. These are really good because it gives you the whole thing all in one system, one purchase, one everything. Next is my favorite kind of stone, which is resin bonded diamond stone. So it's diamonds inside of a resin. These last a very, very long time. They can be quite expensive and you do have to maintenance them, but they're not high maintenance. They are considered somewhat low maintenance. You do have to condition them and flatten them here and there, but they, they cut really fast. They cut really well. They work for any steel and they're, they last for damn near forever. So they're, they're really good because diamond plates tend to wear out. So you can wear these ones out pretty quickly and these ones last a very long time. Now, if you're doing recurve blades, you're gonna want skinny stones. These are resin bonded diamond stones, but you can get skinny stones in any type of stone, but you're gonna want skinny ones. Now you can also use round stones. This is a ceramic, so it's not resin bonded diamonds, but the ceramic rod is something everybody should have in their arsenal because you can use it to maintenance your edge, you can use it to micro bevel, you can use it to remove burrs, and you can use it for recurves. And then we will talk about straps towards the end of the video. All right, now that we know what stones to use, we are going to start, we are going to use the one I recommended that people should use is diamonds. Now, like I said, I have a store down in the description full of all kinds of sharpening supplies that I recommend. But we're gonna start with diamonds and we're gonna show you how to find and hold your angle in a few different ways. So to find the angle that's already on the knife, you wanna lay the blade down flat on the stone. Now there's gonna be a shadow near the heel of the blade underneath the edge. And then you want to lift the spine of the blade up until that shadow goes away near the heel of the blade underneath the edge. That is going to be your angle that's on the knife already. Another way to find your angle is to take the knife and hold it 90 degrees, straight up and down. Now, halfway from the spine to the stone is 45 degrees. Now, halfway between the spine and the stone now is 22.5 degrees. And from there, you can lower it a little bit lower to get to 17, or you can raise it up a little bit higher than that if you wanna go higher than 22.5 degrees. But it'll give you a good idea, and you can do that on both sides. Now another way, you can actually just buy angle guides that you can set on the stone. And what you do is you just rest the blade on the angle guide and then you have to hold and maintain that angle as you go across the stone. And they come in all different angles. Now if you have trouble finding your angle after lifting the blade off the stone and repeating it over and over, once you have your angle, you can take your thumb and push it to the spine of the blade. Pick a specific spot near the front of the blade because you're gonna mark that part of the blade, but you're also gonna take and push your thumb into that position, letting your thumb rest on the stone, right? So you can, so it's, you can basically, you're measuring a height from the stone to the middle of your finger and then mark it. So you have a dent there. Now you can take a marker, which I've already done on mine, and you can mark that spot. That spot is the angle. Now you just have to mark the spot of the blade that you put your finger on. And then now you can literally set it down and put it right to it and you can find that angle if you lift your if you lift it up and set it back down. Now you can transfer this mark over to your other finger by making them kiss on the same surface and then just mark it. Mark that same area. So now I just match this mark with this mark on the stone and I start at the heel of the blade. So make sure the heel is touching. I don't care about the front right now because we'll get to that as we come across the stone. So let the heel of the blade rest on the stone, match the mark of the finger with the mark on the blade. That is my angle. Don't drag your finger across the stone, let it float. Just literally let it float across the stone. This will help you repeat and hold your angle. Now, if you start feeling like it's wearing into your finger, just lift it up, but use it as an indicator when you set it back down. Now, another way to keep and maintain your angle, after you find your angle, remember from the heel of the blade, lock your wrist because 
in order to get to the tip, you don't want to use your wrist because that can make you fluctuate your angle. You need to hold that angle perfectly as it goes across the stone. In order to get to the tip, you just raise your elbow. So if you look at the blade right now, if I want to get to the tip, all I gotta do is raise my elbow and I can get to the tip. Same thing if I'm holding it at an angle. So I lock my wrist and use my elbow to pull it in towards me and raise up to get to the tip. So I can repeat that over and over. Now it might help you to stay locked on and do back and forth motions so you don't lose the angle. If that helps you. Sometimes, it, sometimes people are better at just picking it up and setting it back down and sometimes people are better at going back and forth. You can go back and forth as long as you're holding that angle. The biggest mistake is if you're coming across the stone and you lift your angle or you're coming across the stone and you drop your angle. You don't want to do that. You want to maintain the angle perfectly as you come across the stone. Try to start off with a simple blade shape like a chef knife, drop points, clip points, spear points, things like that. They're going to be the easiest for you to learn on. Now the thickness behind the edge is going to be a big factor on how long it takes you. The thicker the blade and the thicker the edge, the longer it will take and in many cases a lot longer. So I recommend starting off with something thin. Like I said, chef knives or if you know you have a blade with a very thin edge, use that one because it'll be a lot easier than because the biggest time factor in sharpening is the thickness of the blade. Okay, this is the edge zoomed in, and if you look at it, you can see the scratch pattern going up and down. Now, when you start sharpening, you want your scratch pattern to start at the top of the bevel, and as you sharpen, it's going to work its way down to the apex. You don't want to start from the apex and work your way up. You want to start from the top and work your way down to the edge bevel. Now, I'm going to flip it over, and you're going to see it the opposite way. You can see where I've already started. So you see how the scratch pattern started? You can see how it started. This is the top of the bevel, and because I flipped it, so it's the opposite way now. And this is the apex up here. You can see how I started. And you can see the scratch pattern is starting near the, the top of the bevel, and it's working its way down to the apex. See that? That's why it's shining back at you. Now, you want the scratch pattern to be very consistent like this. Ours is going to run at an angle because it'll be a freehand edge, but you see how the scratch pattern is very consistent. So even if it's at an angle, it'll look the same all the way across. Now that you understand the scratch pattern, you're ready to start sharpening. Hold your angle and bring it across the stone, pretending like you're shaving a thin layer off the top of the stone. Don't put a lot of pressure. Just let the stone or the diamonds do the work. So no pressure, just maintain your angle. That's gonna be the most important part. And you're gonna to wanna to continuously look at your scratch pattern that you are creating on your edge and make sure that they are very consistent. Make sure that they're starting at the top of the edge bevel, working their way down to the apex. And you do this until, you do this as long as it takes until the scratch pattern gets to the apex. The apex is the very, very tip of the edge. So make sure the scratch pattern goes all the way to the tip of the edge, and then you wanna check for a burr. And we're gonna talk about exactly what a burr is here in one second. So repeat this motion over and over and over until the scratch pattern covers the entire edge bevel from heel to tip, from the top, to the bottom of the apex and you create a burr. Let's talk about what a burr is. You can see I drew a picture here. This is the stone, this is the knife, the edge bevel is going across the stone like we were doing a second ago. And after you're done, when your scratch pattern goes from the top of the bevel to the apex, it's gonna create a burr. Now understanding what a burr is, is very important to getting a sharp knife. You cannot get a, a perfect edge without understanding how to create a burr and how to remove the burr. 
So that's very important. The burr is a little metal wire that folds over the opposite side. So if you're sharpening this side of the edge bevel, the burr is going to fold over and you're going to feel it on the other side. We're going to take a close look at one right now. Now, once I got the scratch pattern to cover this side of the edge bevel from the top to the apex, I should have a burr. Now you have to understand what a burr is in order to get a sharp knife. If you can't get a burr, create a burr, and remove a burr, you're not going to be able to get a sharp knife. So a burr is when you've sharpened one side, a wire edge folds over to the opposite side. So the side you're not sharpening, you're going to move your finger up and you're going to feel a metal wire folding over. Here in a minute, we're going to talk about how to remove it. But once you have that metal wire from the heel to the tip, from heel all the way through the blade up to the tip, you're ready to go to the other side. Now repeat the same thing on the other side. Make sure you lock your wrist and use your elbow to get to the tip, to get the different sh or the shape of the knife. So lock your wrist so that you can bring you that blade across the stone perfect back and forth. Or even if you're just pushing forward, make sure it's held perfectly. And use your body and your elbow to move it. That will help you lock your angle in so you can create a perfectly flat edge bevel. Now, once you have finished sharpening this side and the scratch pattern is the same way as we talked about before, from heel to tip, from the top of the bevel to the apex, now make sure you have a burr all the way up and down and now you're ready to move to the next stone. Now, depending on what type of steel you're sharpening and your preference is gonna depend on what your finishing stone is. But your first stone should always be your reprofiling stone. You always wanna start with a coarse to extra coarse stone. Then move to a medium grit stone, which is what we are doing right now, which we're gonna use as our finishing stone. And then we'll talk about removing the burr. Okay, so I'm pulling up my Veneve stones and I'm using soap, dish soap and water mixed together. Now, if you're going to make this concoction, you want to make sure you have uh, enough soap in there that when you shake it, after you put the water in, you'll you'll hear it slashing, slushing back and forth and you'll hear the bubbles expand and then you'll stop hearing it. That's when you know you have enough soap in there. Now, if the burr is ever in your way from dragging across the stone, take and do an edge trailing pass, which is a very light pass. All you're trying to do is snag the burr. We're gonna talk more about this in just one second, but that's just so I can get my angle and hold my edge angle going across the stone. Otherwise it might bite into the stone because it's a metal wire. So now I'm gonna repeat the same thing we did on the first stone and I'm gonna create my burr again. Flip it over, do the other side, and then we will talk about how to remove the burr. Because the burr, you don't have to remove between stones, but once you get to your last stone and you're on your last burr, you have to flip it back and forth and knock it off, which will reveal a perfect apex. So I'm ending on a medium grit stone one because that is a great edge finish around 600 grit, but also because in the, the making of this video, I don't want to go to a polish because if you can't do this part, then you're never going to be able to do a polished edge. This is the most important part of any sharpening is learning how to use the coarse stone and the medium grit stone. The coarse stone is your most important stone and the stone you're going to spend the most time on.
Okay, now that we've created a burr from both sides and we're on our finishing burr, so our burr is folded over to the other side, we can remove it a couple different ways. One, you can use a ceramic rod and just lightly scrape the apex across the ceramic rod, no pressure. All you're trying to do is snag the burr off, that's it. It requires no pressure because this is very, very hard, almost like glass. Well, same thing with your stone. You can do the same thing, but you can do edge trailing passes, kind of like you're stropping. But all you're trying to do is let the burr get snagged off. You're gonna fatigue it and then it's gonna pop off because some burrs are, uh, are a little bit more stubborn than others. Some pop off very easily. Some take a little bit of effort and it just depends on how hard the steel is, how big the burr is, and, and, and also the steel itself. So you wanna do some edge trailing passes with no pressure. You're just basically letting the apex snag the stone and until it's mostly removed, until about 90% gone. Then we will move to stropping. Now that we got the burr removed, let's check the edge. Woo! All right, so now we're gonna talk about stropping, how to strop, and also when to strop. Okay, so we put six micron gunny juice on here before we started, and I've let it dry now, so now we're prepared to strop. Now, we want to strop after sharpening to remove any remaining burr from when we did our burr removable, removal. So we did our burr removal on the stone or ceramic rod. Then you want to finish by stropping. Now you want to make sure you hold your angle correctly. You want to start with the tip and do a, a J motion. Now you don't make sure you don't lift. So as you're going across, don't lift the spine like that because that will roll your edge. If you're unsure, holding a lower angle is better than a higher angle because the only thing that'll happen with a lower angle is you'll polish the back of your edge bevel, which will not affect the apex. But as long as you can hold that angle really good, start with the tip, drag the tip down till you get to the belly and then go across with the belly and drop your elbow getting the rest of the edge. And we're gonna do a bunch of passes, about five to 10 per side. Now, another time you want to use the, the strop is in between sharpenings. So say if we go and we use this knife now, we go use it in the field and we cut up some stuff. When we get home, hit it a couple times on the strop. It'll help maintenance the edge and keep it nice and raised or sharp for each time you use it. Now, when the strop does not work anymore, that's when you go to a honing rod. And you can do a couple passes on a honing rod to bring back the edge by making a micro bevel on the apex. But after doing that, use the strop again. So remember, if you've used your knife, Use a strop to maintenance it. If the strop won't work, use the ceramic rod. After the ceramic rod, go back to the strop. Now, if you're having trouble with the burr, you have a pesky burr, you can always take a piece of wood of some kind, use the corner and just use the corner of a piece of wood of some kind if the burr is pesky and just draw it through across the apex. That can remove a little bit of pesky burr that might not want to come off and then go back to stropping. Now, another reason why you're going to want to use a strop is to maintain your edges sharpness. So in between sharpening, so say if you, if I go out right now in the field and I use my knife and I've used it, when I get home, I'm gonna take out my strop and I'm gonna maintain my edge by stropping a few times to hopefully bring back the high level of sharpness I originally had. Now, if the strop does not work, then you wanna go to a ceramic rod. A ceramic rod can micro bevel the apex giving you a little bit more life in your edge. So say if the edge is too dull, the strop's not working, you can do a couple very gentle passes on a ceramic rod on both sides, and then go back to the strop. And that will hopefully give you a little bit more life on your edge. 
So now we're going to talk about how to test your edge on paper. You want to start with the heel and work your way all the way to the tip to make sure that you don't have any inconsistencies. You can take your nail and draw your nail down the apex to see if you feel any hiccups. And as long as it feels like glass and feels nice and smooth, you should be good. Then start the pass through the paper from the heel. You see right there, we had a little tiny, tiny bit of a hiccup right there. So we want to hit it on the burr just a, or hit it on the strop just a little bit more. But it was mostly perfect, but we had one little tiny spot, which is fine. Now let's try it again. And there she goes, she's gone. So you wanna use the paper basically to make sure your apex is nice and clean. Very good. Now we're gonna test the edge on a paper towel. Now this, it takes a high level of sharpness to do this. So if you're not unable to do this, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Just make sure it's paper shaving sharp. But if you can get your apex very clean and learn how to deburr very well, you can learn how to, or you can get your edges sharp enough to cut cleanly through paper towel.